there's there's so many interesting facets to this one that jumps out at me is just how it's a reminder of how immature machine learning is uh, on the traditional engineering side we've got this whole uh, met set of methodologies around testing and you know one of those types of tests is regression testing we know how to do that every engineering team worth its salt you know runs a series of regression tests before they release their product to make sure that the product isn't uh, you know taking steps backwards uh, but this is new in the context of machine learning Exactly. And there's even some aspects of it which are very peculiar and specific to deep learning or more in general, overcomplete uh, models for, for instance, for classification, where if you take a deep learning model, let's say RSNet 152, and you train it on a large data set, let's say ImageNet, uh, if you repeat the experiment 100 times, retrain the same exact model on the same exact data, just from different initial conditions, okay, you converge to 100 different models. But all of them have exactly the same average error. Let's say, you know, 87.3, okay, mm -hmm. whatever it is. They all have the same average error. But when you go and look, the mistakes they make, they're completely different. So it's as if they were trading mistake. I'll get this one right, but give me this one and I'll get it wrong. So it was really eye-opening because, it's, wait a second. So they all make the same number of mistakes, but they're different mistakes. And this is when we realized that very often, some of these criteria, for instance, you know, equal, equal error rate across different demographics, as well as, uh, you know, uh, compatibility with other models, are conflicting with average performance. But here we have a case, we have an ISO error rate surface where all models are equivalent in terms of error rate, but you can move along the surface in high dimensional space to make sure that your model does not make or makes as few mistakes as possible that were not made at the previous model. So you can optimize criteria that are orthogonal and they're not conflicting with each other. So this was the first time we realized that, okay, this is yet another performance criteria that does not impinge on the existing one that we know and, and, and uh, know how to optimize. Mm -hmm. So there are many fascinating phenomena that arise when you start observing the behavior of, of these networks beyond just you know, uh, very standard and, and well-established metrics. A lot of work's been going into trying to understand uh, how deep learning models work and understand their internals. H have you or other uh, previous researchers looked at this idea of um, maybe the way that error rate, or not error rates, but the types of errors kind of cluster across this ISO uh, yeah. error rate or accuracy uh, frontier? Uh, yes, uh, quite a bit of work. So. Um, well, first of all, a kind of a preamble. It's fascinating how uh, you know 20 years ago we thought that with math and analysis we would be in, we would be informing research in neuroscience, and now we find ourselves doing kind of artificial neuroscience and probing deep network the way neuroscientists probe neuronal networks, which is kind of interesting uh, twist of events. Uh -huh. But yes, we've been looking at that at various stages. So one is uh, with a former postdoc of mine. His name is Hussein Mobahi. We were looking at universal adversarial perturbations, where we realized that. If you take the data and perturb them in a way that uh, uh, hits the closest decision boundary so that with the smallest possible perturbation, you change the class and you fool the network, so to speak, all of these perturbations are aligned, which you know is very mysterious. And, and then aligned on, in what sense? Say, say it again. Aligned in what sense? They're aligned in the sense that their direction in the high dimensional space of representations is parallel. They're parallel to each other. So, so that you can find a single perturbations that apply to all the data with high probability changes the class at the output. Mm -hmm. So uh, that says something about the structure of the decision boundaries. They, there are regions of high curvature. And so it's very different from what we had in mind, kind of coming from you know, standard uh, four-dimensional classifiers like SPN and so on. Uh, there was another aspect that was really puzzling to me. So this was when Alessandro Achille, who's a scientist at AWS now, but when I was still a student with a friend from Harvard Neuroscience, they had this conjecture uh, that neural networks exhibit critical learning periods. Now, what is critical learning period? So in biological systems, you know, the, either you learn a skill when you're young or you don't learn. You know, this is why you cannot teach uh, old dog new tricks. And this is why if you're born with a defect like cataract or with uh, uh, severe myopia, unless you correct it early, no matter how much time you have to recoup, you never learn right, right? So the optical defect is fixed. 
So it's, it's resolved, but your brain has not learned correctly, and then you never learn correctly. Yes. So, and this is normally attributed to biology, to bi biochemistry of the brain. You know, you stop generating synapses, and so you, you age. But neural networks don't age. Their connectivity is fixed at the outset. It doesn't change. So I told him, you know, this is, uh, you guys are crazy. This is, uh, why would you ever expect that a neural network would have a behavior like that? It turns out it does, and which is really puzzling because now you want, okay, now it cannot be biochemistry because an artificial neural network doesn't have any. It doesn't, there's a vague resemblance to the brain, but really this phenomenon must be an information phenomenon. And then we start to dig in to say, okay, what, what does even mean information in a deep network? You know, what, a deep network is a deterministic system. So it has zero entropy, the weights are fixed, right? The input output map once trained is deterministic. So it has infinite mutual information between the input and the output. So all of the standard concept of information theory are not useful and they're not useful to probe the inside, the guts of the network. And so we spend a lot of time defining and measuring information quantities in these gigantic networks, you know, hundreds of millions of parameters and now even trillions. And what we discover, for instance, is that, <laughs> I don't know if you remember uh, the movie, uh, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, mm -hmm. uh, where the protagonist uh, uh, has, a, uh, you know, for whatever reason, wants to forget experience related to a person or a partner. And so goes to a company called Lacuna that, uh, under you know does something you know showing some pictures of the partner zap the brain to erase memory of it. So we thought, well, maybe we can do that with deep networks, right? We can zap the brain to forget or to erase memory of something that you saw in your training set. And it turns out that that is possible to do with deep networks because once you understand how information is defined and computed and distributed in the representation, then you can inject noise in very specific direction that will force you to erase a particular datum or a class or a cohort of data, which now is also important because of privacy issues and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of fascinating questions that arise when you try to understand how these networks operate and you have existence proofs of what is possible to do thanks to you know, biology, the human visual system, the animal visual system. So there is definitely a lot more back and forth uh, between the bio biological inspiration and the analysis than there was 20 years ago when we thought, you know, uh, that maybe we'll solve the brain, you know, with, with analysis. And, and uh, somebody in the 90s told me that, uh, you know, if you, if you think of science and understanding as a process of compression, you, know, as you observe the astra and uh, you could record their positions, but once you understand uh, the laws of physics, you can compress them into a law. And maybe the brain is the most compressed possible representation of itself. There is no easier brain of representing the brain than the brain itself. And if it's true for deep networks, then then how do we how do we leverage? You know, our reduc reductionist uh, uh, scientific method has not been successful in this particular area. So we need a more holistic approach. We need to define and measure information, and then once you do that, you realize that despite the gigantic uh, the gigantic uh, dimension of these spaces, the amount of information that they store is a tiny fraction. And the way in which they store it is fascinating. I love it because uh, I can claim that I'm still learning even if I'm aging because these networks at the beginning accrue a lot of information, sort of they memorize, and then they start shedding information, throwing away information, and they do this while improving the expected error or the test error in the data set that you have sequestered. So. In a sense, it seems like forgetting or throwing away information is a necessary part of learning, which when I talk to biologists, they say, oh, of course, but I've never seen yeah. it written in math. I've never seen a claim that is uh, defensible based on data arise from that. So it's really, uh, there's a lot of interplay between understanding biological networks and understanding uh, 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 artificial networks.